understandings arise amongst us. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all joyous and suffering beings everywhere. So we're studying the life of Holy Mother and we've come to <coughs> chapter 17, Holy Mother's Caretakers. Holy Mother's Caretakers. <coughs> Uh, Bala Krishna, would you read the uh, Sanskrit uh, introduction to this? I can't, of course, read it. I mean, I, it, if it were English, I could, I can read it. But uh, there, there is English also there. I know. I'll read that okay. afterwards. Okay. Okay. Mriduna, Varuna, Hanti, Mriduna, Hanti. Adarunam Nasevyam Mriduna Kinchit Tasmat Sikshanantaram Mriduhu. It says it's from the Mahabharata. From Mahabharata Shloka, yes, yeah, right. 831. So gentleness conquers the hearts of the cruel as well as the kind. There is nothing in this world that gentleness cannot conquer. So gentleness is a powerful virtue. I'll read that again. This is sometimes translated as love rather than gentleness. Gentleness conquers. Ah, come on. Gentleness conquers the hearts of the cruel as well as the kind. There is nothing in the world that gentleness cannot conquer. So gentleness is a powerful virtue. <clears throat> Holy Mother was the embodiment of modesty and gentleness, love and compassion, simplicity and humility, unselfishness and forgiveness. As a divine being, she was endowed with a predominance, a preponderance of sattva. So she did not behave like other women of her time. As a divine being, she was endowed with a preponderance of sattva. So she did not behave like other women of her time. As an ideal Indian woman of the early 20th century, she was not demanding or aggressive. She found joy through love and unselfish service. She was extremely modest, but that does not mean she was meek or docile when challenged by injustice or wickedness. <clears throat> She represented the motherhood of God in this age. I'm going to repeat that. Holy Mother Sri Sharada Devi represented, was an embodiment, the actuality of the motherhood of God in this age and conducted Ramakrishna's spiritual ministry through her divine power, which overwhelmed everyone who approached her. Now notice the language, everyone who approached her. There were many who just knew Mother as a village woman in Jairambati. Uh, there were not very many people who knew her uh, like that uh, in, uh, in Kolkata, but there were some. Uh, they would encounter her and, and uh, because of her modesty and her uh, self-effacement, they would think, oh, why do people make such a big deal of this woman? What are, what? Well, notice the language. She, overwhel she overwhelmed everyone who approached her, who came to her in some way. Nonetheless, as a sweet, 
compassionate mother. It was, it was not possible for us, her to say as a sweet, compassionate mother, it was not possible for her to say a harsh word to anyone. So she sometimes, she sometimes endured the ill behavior of strangers and unbalanced disciples. Yeah, this is true. She forgave them as a loving mother does her children. She regarded everyone as her children, of course. <clears throat> when she came in contact with people of the wider world and began to act as a guru, she needed people to protect her. Ramakrishna had foreseen her future rule, role as a, Ramakrishna had foreseen her future role as a guru. So he selected two strong and wise companions for her, Golapma and Yoginma. <clears throat> We've been introduced to these women before, particularly Golapma is uh, quite a remarkable character. She's sharp-tongued, very assertive in her uh, protection of mother, and even takes it on herself to correct mother, which sometimes mother gently reproves her for. Um, uh, but, uh, so, but these were two strong and wise companions. Now the story goes that both these women and some others who were close to mother were gopis in Vrindavan. And having been given <coughs> liberation by Sri Krishna, <coughs> requested, requested that they accompany mother, who was Radha, according to what we are given to understand. When she took another incarnation, they accompanied her. And so that's the story, that's one of the things that's said about Golapma, Yoginma, and others. So two strong and wise companions, Golapma and Yoganma. At Koshipur, just before the master passed away, Holy Mother felt helpless and burst into tears. The master consoled her saying, why should you feel troubled? You will live as you are living now. The disciples, they, the disciples, will do for you what they are doing for me. Now, of course, we know from what we read earlier in the book that that didn't begin right away. She went back to Kamarpukur and lived in some privation for some time before people discovered her circumstances and began to take proper care of her. But who knows, as, uh, as Swami Chetanananda wrote, uh, and when we were reading that section of the book, who knows what it was that was developing in her as a result of these privations uh, when she was living at Kamar Pukur. <clears throat> so ultimately, Sri Ramakrishna's words came to pass. They, the disciples, will do for you what they are doing for me. Sharda Devi in Calcutta, 1905. All of the master's monastic disciples loved and respected Holy Mother and offered their services when needed. But Swami's Yogananda and Saradananda especially became her devoted attendants and served her with heart and soul. And if you... If you read in uh, the great master or the divine play of Sri Ramakrishna, there are some details about Yogananda and how he felt about uh, mother. Maybe they'll be portrayed here too. But uh, in any event, Swami's Yogananda, Yogananda and Sardananda especially became her devoted attendants and served her with heart and soul. 
these two disciples became her trusted caretakers. Swami Brahmananda. Although Swami Brahmananda, as the head of the order, was busy traveling to various places, initiating people and training monks, he always kept an eye on Holy Mother. Once Holy Mother described her caretakers, Jogin, she never referred to the monks by their monastic names, by the way. She always referred to Swami Vivekananda as Naren. She always referred to Brahmananda as Rakal. And here she's referring to uh, Swami Yogananda as Jogin. Once Holy Mother described her caretakers, Jogin, Yogananda, and Sharat, Sardananda, are my real caretakers. Rakal Brahmananda is not of that temperament. He can't put up with difficulties. He can't look after me mentally or through. He can, he, I'm sorry, he can't put up with difficulties. He can look after me mentally or through, some el through someone else. He is cast in a different mold. Now, what mold was Brahmananda cast in? If you read the Eternal Companion by Swami Prabhupananda, we find that after he matured and made what he, he was asked why he had to do spiritual disciplines that hadn't Sri Ramakrishna given him everything. He said, yes, but I had to make what he gave me my own. Why? So he could give it away. You can't give away what you don't own. So Swami Brahmananda became the embodiment of giving away the love and spiritual treasure of Sri Ramakrishna. And this is why when mother says he can't put up with difficulties, well, he could solve difficulties very well. But where someone else might have taken harsh action and done so quickly, which is regarded as efficient, of course, Swami Brahmananda would take two weeks to resolve an issue and do it through love and through silence. So this is what mother means by that. She's not saying that there's anything wrong with him. She's just saying he's of a different temperament, a different, he's cast in a different mold. Mm -hmm. Swami Brahmananda's no. rubber. Hmm? There is a footnote a little bit. You want oh, me to no, go ahead and read it, please. This is what, you know, put up with the difficulties. Mm -hmm. The mother is explaining. Holy Mother was referring to difficulties among the women around her and between the members of her family. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, there, there were many difficulties. Her two brothers yes. were, were both uh, a piece of work. So thank you. Thank you, Bala Krishna, for, for reading that. Uh, I'm glad we have that specificity. Swami Brahmananda's reverence for Holy Mother was too deep for words. At the very sight of her, he was overwhelmed with spiritual emotion. As a spiritual son of Ramakrishna, he was often absorbed in an, an ecstatic mood that made him partially or practically in an ecstatic mood that made him practically unapproachable. All I can say is yes to that. But in the presence of Holy Mother, he acted like a child. Whenever he visited her, he prostrated before her with great love and respect. Holy, Mother's, Holy Mother affectionately caressed him, touching his chin 
and gently stroked his head and chest. Once he received her blessing, he left the room quickly. Why? Because he would, <laughs> he would burst into tears. He was, he was so moved by her. The mother would send him a tray of sweets, which he enjoyed immensely. Brahmananda truly worshipped Holy Mother as a goddess. Once he remarked, it is very difficult to understand Mother. She moves about veiling her face like an ordinary woman, but in reality she is the mother of the universe. Could we have recognized her if the Master herself had not revealed to us who she was? What is that footnote to Balakrishna? Thank you for volunteering to read the footnotes. Uh, no, there is no footnote, footnote for that. Yeah, there is. It's, it, it's yeah, but, footnote no. two, it says. Okay, but there are two stars here. There is another one be, below. The, see, there is no footnote for number two. Oh, ah, okay. Hmm. We'll, we'll come across it at the end of this section, and maybe I'll read it if it seems important. On another occasion, Brahmananda said, is it possible for an ordinary being to accept the worship of an incarnation like Sri Ramakrishna? In other words, yeah, yeah, Balakrishna. What? He was referring to the master's worship of Sharda Devi as Shodasha in Dakshineshwar. Right. That, that's what this refers to, of course. Yeah. Is it possible for an ordinary being to accept the worship of an incarnation like Sri Ramakrishna? Mm, certainly not. From this, one may understand what a great fountain of power Mother is. Notice that the Swami doesn't say was. Mother is just as much with us as the Master is. If you approach the picture, when, when you come into the chapel, as you come through the door, directly ahead of you, there is a picture of Mother. It's a picture taken in Jairambati on the porch of her house. If you approach that picture with reverence, as Brother Dhruva spoke of it one day when he spoke about Mother. You can feel her presence. You can feel her presence. From this, one may understand what a great fountain of power Mother is. We have seen with our own eyes. Now, this is the Swami talking. Chetananda, we have seen with our own eyes that Mother takes the sins and afflictions of many people upon herself and gives them liberation. Can anyone but the Divine Mother have this power? Inside the great ocean of realization, outside absolute calm. How ordinary and simple she appears. Even the incarnations cannot keep divine moods under control. Sri Ramakrishna manifested them outwardly. But it was extremely difficult to understand Mother. She has, she has kept us all deluded with her motherly love. Swami Vivekananda now, just imagine this for yourself. Swami Vivekananda said that mother dwelt at the fifth plane, the plane of the throat. Above the heart, if she had ascended higher, she, he said, she would have left the body. She controlled her spiritual power and her spiritual tendencies and remained in that bhava samadhi at the fifth level. 
it's a level of power. Hmm? One, three, and five are, are levels of power. So her power was being emanated from that, but in this extremely gentle and, uh, but as, as, as people said, you know, as it was said earlier in, the, in, the, in these paragraphs, she was overwhelming to those who approached her. So now we have a subhead, Swami Yogananda. I'm glad that he's going into some detail as, about Swami Yogananda because this is such a remarkable story. When Swami Yogananda was a young man, then known as Jogin, he was suspicious about the master's relationship with Holy Mother. One evening in Dakshineshwar, Jogan decided to spend the night with the master with the intention of serving him if needed. Ramakrishna was pleased. After dinner, the master went to bed and Jogan made his own bed on the floor and slept. Throughout his life, Jogan was a light sleeper. At midnight, he woke up and found that the master was not in his bed. He looked for the water pot that the master used for washing and found it in its proper place. He thought that the master might be walking outside, but he could not find him there. Suddenly a terrible suspicion gripped him, gripped his mind. Has the master gone to the Nahabat to be with his wife? Can it be possible that his actions are contrary to his teachings? Determined to find out the truth without delay, Jogan stationed himself near the Nahabat. But while he waited there and watched the door of the Nahabat, he heard the clattering of the master's sandals coming from the direction of the Panchavati. Within a few moments, Ramakrishna appeared in front of Jogan and said, and asked, hello, why are you standing here? Embarrassed, Jogan hung his head in shame from having doubted the master. He could not utter a single word. The master understood everything from the expression on his face. Instead of taking offense, Ramakrishna reassured Jogan, well, you are quite right. You must examine a holy man by day and by night before believing in Notice, he didn't scold him for doubting, for being suspicious. <laughs> Instead, he congratulated him. Yes, you're quite right. You must examine a holy man by day and by night before believing in him. Though forgiven, Jogan could not sleep that night. After his passing away, the master uprooted Jogan's doubt and relieved his feelings of guilt. After his passing away, the master uprooted Jogan's doubt and relieved his feelings of guilt. When Holy Mother was in Vrindavan, the master appeared to her and asked her to initiate Jogan and make him her first disciple and caretaker. Now, Sri Ramakrishna, of course, had already given Jogan instruction. So the mother protested. If you remember, we read that earlier about the incidents in Vrindavan. She, she said, but he's already your disciple. He said, no, you take this mantra, you give it to him. When Holy Mother was in Vrindavan, the master appeared to her and asked her to initiate Jogan and make him her first disciple and caretaker. Hmm. 
later Kumud Badu Sen recalled, as Swami Yogananda began describing his Ah, as, as Swami Yogananda began describing this event of initiation, his voice became choked with deep emotion. In conclusion, he remarked, the image of the master and the mother will never fade from my memory. I realized that both of them were of divine origin and that they had been, that they had incarnated in human form out of compassion for the devoted millions. Swami Sardananda wrote, Swami Yogananda completely atoned for his offense, first by surrendering himself completely to his guru and serving him, and then when the master passed away by devoting his life to the service of the Holy Mother. Well, from here, I see no offense. I think Sri Ramakrishna said it correctly. You're right. You should examine. You should test a holy man. Just as Vivekananda, if you remember Vivekananda, having heard that the master could not endure the touch of money, the master slept on a thin mattress. And so in those days, a rupee was made of gold. So Vivekananda slipped into Ramakrishna's room when the master wasn't there and put a rupee under the edge of his mattress. Now the master, at least physically, saw nothing. You know, he wasn't, he didn't observe uh, Naren doing this. And he came in and he sat down on his bed and he immediately jumped up. He said, ow, 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 it feels like I'm being, I've been bit by a scorpion. And of course, Vivekananda was very abashed. But the master again said, no, good. This is what you should do. Test, test a holy man's words. <laughs> so when the master passed away, Jogan devoted his life to the service of Holy Mother. And boy, did she value it, as we'll hear. There's a picture of him, Swami Yogananda. Such a simple, sweet face. And there's a picture of Sardananda. <laughs> In August, ah ha ha ha, good, thank you. Thank you, Balakrishna. In August 1886, after the master's passing away, Yogananda went on pilgrimage with the Holy Mother. Then in September 1887, he accompanied, he accompanied her to Kamarpukur and stayed there for three days. In November 1888, Yogananda went to Puri with Holy Mother and stayed there with her and stayed with her there. Hmm. In November 1888, Yogananda went to Puri with Holy Mother and stayed with her there for three months. In February 1889, he again went to Kamarpukur with the mother, who stayed there for a year. After leaving Holy Mother in Kamarpukur, Yogananda left for his own pilgrimage and to practice severe austerities. He spent most of his time in meditation. Once a day, he would go out to beg for food. Sometimes he ate only dry bread soaked in water for two or three days at a time. This practice ruined his digestive system, which was delicate to start with. In 1898, when Holy Mother lived at 10-2 Bushborough Lane, 
a rented house in Bug Bazaar, Calcutta, Yogananda and Brahmachari Krishnalal took care of her and, run, and ran all her errands. Yogananda posted himself at the entrance as a gatekeeper, receiving gifts for Holy Mother and regulating the devotees' visits. Sister Nivedita described the place in The Master as I Saw Him. This is a quote from Nivedita. It was a strange household of which I now found myself a part. Downstairs, in one of the guard rooms beside the front door, lived a monk, Yogananda, whose, whose severe austerities from his youth up had brought him to the threshold of death from consumption in the prime of manhood. Now, consumption is how tuberculosis was referred to in those days. So Yogananda was referred, was suffering from consumption and, and, and malnutrition because he couldn't eat. I mean, his digestion was so bad. So his severe austerities from his youth up had brought him to the threshold of death from consumption in the prime of manhood. To his room, I used to go for Bengali lessons. In the kitchen, in the kitchen behind worked a disciple, Krishnalal, a disciple of his, actually of Holy Mother, Nivedita um, misunderstood. She thought it was uh, Yogananda's disciple, it was Holy Mother's disciple. In the kitchen behind worked a disciple, Krishnalal, and a Brahmin cook while to us women folk belonged all above stairs with roof terraces and the site of the Ganges hard by. Hard by means close by. Holy Mother later commented, Jogan and Charat belonged to my inner circle. No one loved me as Jogan did. If anybody gave him money, he would save it saying, Mother will use it for her pilgrimage. The other monks teased him for living in this household full of women. He asked me to address him as Yoga. Yogananda was so respectful toward Holy Mother that he would not touch her feet when he bowed down, but instead waited until she left the room and then touched his forehead to the spot where she had been. When asked about this strange behavior, Yogananda replied, what? I don't have the audacity to keep the mother standing and waiting for me so that I can bow down to her. Hmm. Can you imagine? He meant this. This is not some posture. When asked about it or teased about it, Yogananda replied, what? I don't have the audacity to keep the mother standing and waiting for me so that I can bow down to her. Love is demonstrated by emotion and thoughtfulness. Regarding Yogananda's concern for her, Holy Mother recalled, every year since that time, after the vision of the goddess Jagadatri, I have gone home for Jagadatri Puja as often as possible. I used to help by polishing the puja utensils and looking after other things. Formerly, there were not many people in the family, so I went home to clean the pots and pans. Later, Jogan got a set of wooden utensils for me, he said. Later, Jogan got a set of wooden utensils for me. He said, Mother, you do not have to scour pots and pans anymore. He also secured a piece of land to provide for the expenses of the puja. Jogananda's loving service and devotion left a deep impression on Holy Mother's heart. 
He once presented her with a quilt when it eventually became worn out from constant use. Holy Mother considered changing the cover and having it stuffed with fresh cotton, but then she gave up that idea, the idea since she thought it would change the look of the gift from her beloved disciple. Mother often would not throw away things that were worn out that had been given to her. Swami Yogananda passed away in Samadhi at 3.10 p.m. on 28 March 1899 at the age of 38. So even younger than Swami Vivekananda. His health had been broken by his austerities and he just was delicate from, from his boyhood. Swami Yogananda passed away in Samadhi at 3.10 p.m. on 28 March 1898 at the age of 38. Toward the end, he said to Holy Mother, Mother, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva and Sri Ramakrishna have come to take me. Can you imagine? <laughs> the, the three children of Mother, Brahma, Vishnu Shiva and Sri Ramakrishna have come to take me. That morning while performing worship, that morning while performing worship, Holy Mother saw that the Master had come to take Yogananda. When Yogananda breathed his last, Brahmachari Krishna Lal cried out. Holy Mother was upstairs and realized what had happened. She burst into tears and said, my Jogan has left me. Who will now look after me? Holy Mother burst into tears and said, My Jogan has left me. Who will now look after me? Because Yogananda was the first of the Master's disciples to die, Mother remarked with a deep sigh, a brick has slipped from the structure. Now the whole thing will come down. There's a footnote number nine. Balakrishna, can you make any sense of what that, does that footnote appear in the book? No, no Shankaraji. Mm. I think this refers to all these numbers might be refers to something else. I, I don't know. Well, well, we'll we'll see at the end of this section. Even a divine being like Holy Mother, even a divine being like Holy Mother, and we'll notice that in the life of the Master, he also would be grief-stricken. Even a divine being like Holy Mother was grief-stricken by Yogananda's passing. The Mahabharata says, at the end of prosperity, there is decline. After union, there is separation. After life, there is death. So now we have another important person in mother's life as a caretaker, Swami Trigunatitananda. Now Trigunatitananda was a character. Um, We'll probably find out about it here. I won't try and tell you, but if it doesn't mention some things, then I'll mention them afterwards. After Swami Yogananda's passing, Swami Trigunatitananda took charge of Holy Mother's physical needs in addition to editing the Udbodhan journal. He served her from 1899 until he left for America in 1902. So for three years. His zeal in serving her sometimes appeared almost obsessive. In October 1899, Holy Mother was, this was, this was Trigunatitananda's way. It probably won't mention it here, but it, in a way it's what cost him his life. 
his obsessive behavior in San Francisco caused uh, a madman to uh, to take a, a, a strong dislike to him, uh, actually a hatred for him, and threw a bomb at him in the San Francisco temple. The Swami didn't die right away, but he did. Uh, he did die some days later of sepsis, not, not of uh, the wound itself. The wound itself became infected and it was sepsis that caused, took its life. So this obsessiveness was part of Trigunatita's personality and um, Swami Vivekananda used to tease him about it. Holy Mother was going to Jairambati in a bullock cart via Burdwan. It was past midnight. Trigunatitananda was walking in front of the cart as her bodyguard with a heavy stick on his shoulder. Suddenly he saw a wide breach in the road made by a flood. At once he realized that the cart could either be overturned or receive a terrific jolt not only disturbing the mother's sleep, but possibly injuring her. Immediately, he laid his large body in the breach. Hmm. Now imagine, there's, there's, a, there's a, 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 the road has been washed away in a, in a, there's a so there's a ditch in the road. Immediately, he laid his large body in the breach and asked the driver to continue over him. Fortunately, Holy Mother awoke before this happened. She took in the situation and rebuked her disciple for his rashness. But, you know, he would have, he would have endured it. He would have, you know, to spare the Holy Mother any disturbance or possible injury. He would have allowed the bullock cart to roll over him as he laid in that ditch. She, Holy Mother, took in the situation and rebuked his, her disciple for his rashness. Trigunatita's love for and faith in the Holy Mother was phenomenal. Once Joginma asked the Swami to buy some hot chilies for Mother in his eagerness to get her the hottest chilies possible. <laughs> this is his obsessiveness. Just some hot chilies won't do. He has to get the hottest chilies possible. In his Eagerness to get her the hottest chilies possible. He walked through many markets from Bag Bazaar to Bar, Bar, Bar Bazaar, from Bag Bazaar to Bar Bazaar, a distance of four miles, tasting all the hot chilies until his tongue became red and swollen. At last, he found the hottest ones at Bar Bazaar and brought them to the mother. When Holy Mother heard about this, she said, what devotion to the guru. Later, when Trigunatitananda went to America, he sent money regularly for Holy Mother's personal service. Trigunatitananda was, uh, I don't know how much he slept, but not much. Uh, if you go sometime, and I hope you have the opportunity. It's been recently, and I mean within the last few years, has been very thoroughly and, and accurately restored to the condition it was in uh, when Trigunatitananda left it, the old temple in San Francisco. It's a beautiful structure. He designed it. It's the first Hindu temple in America. It was a, a temple. 
and he designed it. He can supervised its construction. And it was so well designed and so well built that it survived the earthquake. It was finished in 1905. The earthquake, the San Francisco, the great fire and uh, the great earthquake and fire in San Francisco happened in 1906. That old temple survived the earthquake without any serious damage at all. And that was a big earthquake. I mean, that was a big, big earthquake. I forget what the Richter estimate is on it, but it was big. <coughs> and then there was the fire. And it was at the top of a hill. It's, it's, it's at the top of a hill. Or most of, yeah, I think it's at the actual top of a hill. Now, normally a fire will burn right up a hill and, and burn right into it. Well, for whatever reason, the master's protection, perhaps. But uh, nevertheless, um, you know, San Francisco was shaken to its foundations. Many buildings simply fell down. And uh, well-built buildings. Um, but not that old temple. I hope that you all get, at some point get a chance to visit it. So the temple is on the top of the hill? Well, it's on, on the top of a hill. Okay. You know, San Francisco is a city of hills. Oh. And uh, so it's, it's at the top of a hill. And then uh, it's, it, it's on a ridge, so to speak. Uh, not, the, not the very top of the hill. The, very, the, the new temple is further up the hill. But the, the old temple is on a ridge that uh, is a part of that hill. Any other comments or questions while we're stopped? Uh, I think that temple is still not being used. Is that correct? It's, it's, there are people living there. Um, monastics live there and other uh, dedicated disciples live there in the, in the residential quarters. I actually stayed there for some days one time when I was in San Francisco at Swami Prabhudananda's direction. I stayed there. But you, now they meet at the new temple, which is uh, well, yes. a little, yeah, little distance away from that. Yes, it's further up the hill, and uh, yeah, yeah, and and uh, it's very, very different, uh, very, very different. But uh, the, the they they do use the old temple for certain special observances. Okay. I don't know the details, but uh, if you if you ask for it, you can receive. The, the bulletins from the Vedanta Society of Northern California, and they'll tell you. Okay, I have, I have one question. Yes, did, did Holy Mother wear the veil all throughout or at some point she stopped using the veil? When, it, when she was in Kolkata, she wore the veil. When she was in Jairambati, by and large not. There were times when she would be veiled in Jairambati, when, when people came to visit that uh, she didn't feel comfortable with. But uh, uh, by and large, uh, she was unveiled in Jairambati and except with her female companions. And I think with a couple of the monks. She was veiled in, uh, in Kolkata. And I might even be mistaken about the monks. She was very modest and, and uh, retiring uh, in, in Kolkata. She would be available to anyone, but uh, she would be veiled there. Thanks for the yeah. question, Shah. Thank you. In Jairamati, she was very free. That's one of the reasons she loved to go to Jairamati. She didn't have to be veiled. She didn't have to uh, disguise herself, so to speak. Um, just a, a pointer here. Yes. She actually did, did use veil um, 
goofs all the time, even in front of monastic disciples and even the younger ones. Yes. And, uh, <clears throat> there is an incident. Uh, who was that Swami over here? Um, her disciple, Ashishanandaji? Yeah. And when he was very young, when he was 18 or 19, he went and prostrated before her and she was wearing veil, but he was very close to her. And so he, he bent down and then when he looked up, he saw her eyes were actually made of coal fire, fire actually. They were real fire, it, it hit her eyes. And then he, he just got her, you know, her, he just saw her divine uh, presence there. And then he backed off and then he, he shared that. So, uh, yeah, the, just to mention here that, yeah, she used to use veil. In, in, in Calcutta, yes, yeah, she was almost Calcutta. always veiled. Yeah. Uh, the, the, what, uh, what Shailesh very appropriately just mentioned was uh, Swami Aseshananda, who was a, a remarkable Swami uh, and was the head of the Portland, Oregon Center for many decades. And he was Holy Mother's disciple uh, and was hmm. well, I, I, I won't distract. We've got a, we've got a few minutes left here. Um, let's see, it's, it's 8.53. So before we start a reading about Swami Saradananda, are there any, any other comments or questions that anyone has? Please, this is where we do this together. Brother Shankara, I have a comment. Or yes, Haima. In the beginning of the chapter, uh, gentleness conquers the hearts of the cruel as well as the kind. But when you look back in the history, like Hiranyakasipa and all this, he had a son, gentle son, Prahlada and his wife Leelavati was such a gentle woman and it never conquered his cruelty. And <laughs> how much love we can send it to our White House to conquer the cruelty of people. <laughs> well, the, the, the demonic tendency there's a difference between just cruelty and being truly a demonic personality, a true asura or daitya. <clears throat> um, as a matter of fact, it's said in the Chandi, they hate righteousness. The, the, the manifestation, as you said, in the relationship between that demonic king and his son, and that one. Uh, he hated his righteousness and and did everything he could to destroy it. So that's a different matter. Um, and as to uh, our current political situation, uh, the best we can do is try to recognize the divine presence in everyone that's right. and, and offer our prayers. Um, what, what happens and what will happen uh, you know, we just have to take resort to what it says in the Gita. It's the gunas that are doing all this. We think that the human beings are the doers, but Krishna says explicitly not. Don't be deluded, he says. It's the gunas that are doing this. Thank you. And so, uh, it's, but it is, it, it's, so it's good for us to try to promote sattva, to, for us to try to manifest within ourselves and then project out into the world the revealing power of sattva, because that is the healing power. Yes, that is the healing power. But can it heal a demonic personality? Okay. Mm, we don't know. <laughs> but it, certainly it will make the situation better even every little bit we do Swami Prabhavananda was absolutely adamant about, adamant about that our prayers do make a difference he said what do you think you are not connected 
definitely. Prayer has come. We're connected. Yes. Thank you. This Thank you, Haimo. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, one more question. Uh, yes, Sham. Uh, one more question is, uh, did master ever initiate yogin? This is an open question. <clears throat> he gave him instructions, which included a mantra. Did this, and mother knew this, which is why she protested to him when she, he appeared to her in Vrindavan, but you've already done this for doing it. He said, no, I want you to do it. And whether it was a different mantra, uh, it may be known in the order, it may be part of the oral tradition in the order, but I've never heard anyone say anything about it, nor have I read anything about it. Shailesh, do you know anything about that? No, I think uh, my understanding is that he was training her. And so even if he had given her mantra, uh, she, he asked her again, he asked her holy mother again to give him. Um, yeah. And whether yeah. it was the same mantra that he had given Yogan before, I suspect not. But uh, but that's just my suspicion. I, I don't. Know. Yeah, I, I I don't think so. It's it's mentioned anywhere. If not you find, I, if you try to dig out, we might find uh, some information as to what was his ishta during that time, and they were in um, in Vrindavan. That's where that happened, right? So. I think whatever was his Easter, he, he, it may have been that he gave uh, him Kali Mantra when he was at Dakshineshwar and then later on when he saw the mood was changing, he may have given uh, him, uh, asked her to give him uh, the, the Krishna Mantra. That's my understanding. But. Okay, good. Anybody else? Anything else? Shankaraji, the numbers what we saw before? Yes. That uh, represents where that material came from. Actually, this number nine came from the Swami Gambhirananda Sri Srima Sar Sarada Devi Udbodhana Office, Calcutta, 2008. Yeah. That was the uh, Gambhirananda wrote uh, the thickest. I mean, it's about, it's about uh, four inches thick, uh, his biography of Holy Mother. It is totally exhaustive, but it's not very readable <laughs> as, as not like this that we're reading now. Um, it's that's not as approachable, but it is absolutely, Gambirananda was one of those um, extremely detail oriented fellows. And so he, uh, and they, that showed is when he when he was general secretary and president of the order and so on. He, um, but it, it's good that uh, that he did all of that research and and discovered all this information, even though it's not presented in the most readable fashion. But thank you, thank you for letting us know what those numbers represent. Anything else from anyone? Swayam, anything? No, Brother Shankara. I'm just in a listening mode today. Okay, very good. All right. Well, it's now nine o'clock. So we'll ring down the curtain on this class. Oh. Kali, Kali, Bole, Ma, 
Shri Devi Durga, Durga Bolema. Sharada Devi, Devi Bolema. Sweet Mother Mary, Mary Bolema. Sweet Mother Mary, Sharada Devi, Shri Devi Durga, Nakshina Kali, Kali Bolema. Ma, 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 bole. Peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all joyous and suffering beings everywhere. Just a footnote. They have discovered the possibility of life on Venus. They have discovered a chemical, phosphine, in the atmosphere of Venus in such quantities that the most reasonable explanation is that it is being produced by something living in the atmosphere. Phosphine is only produced by living organisms, apparently, in, in the circumstances that exist on, on Venus, and it breaks down so if it were produced by some like volcanic event or something like that, although they say that's very unlikely, um, that it would break down and disappear. So now they're, they're bending every effort oh, through other uh, telescopic and, uh, and uh, other observational means to get a, a more uh, accurate bead on this. But uh, it is just remarkable. This was just this just appeared in the science news from the New York Times today. But the, of course, it's not something that was published there. It was published in astrophysical journals. Mm, but I just think it's very fascinating that our nearest neighbor, <laughs> Venus, our nearest neighbor, may actually harbor some form of life. So you can read about that. If you, if you go to the New York Times website, you can read about that for yourself. Phosphine, produced only um, in, in, in here, it's produced in our intestines, and it's also found in the feces of badgers and penguins. Amazing. So, Let's hope they come up with some more very interesting findings. Talking the surface. Hmm? Brother Shankara. Yes. Talking about Holy Mother and uh, extraterrestrial life, you know what she commented, right? No, what did she say? Oh, she, when, when someone asked her that, is there human life somewhere else? And she said, no. Not human life. Yeah, no. exactly. Yeah. But there could be other yeah, forms. Yeah. Of I mean, I'm just talking about it. No, no, I don't think there's human life there. And, and the, the, certainly that's not what the scientists are positing. But as we see from the Gita, when Krishna shows Arjuna his universal form, there are forms of life everywhere. Forms of being and life, just everywhere. And if you look at the parallel universe theory, then she may have been referring to our our you know our universe or i don't know i mean it's complicated but just just wanted to throw in there no i i you're absolutely right to point it out that that uh, that uh, that uh, no human life uh, that's not what the scientists are saying at all but some form of bacterial life yeah yeah i know i i would I'm have sorry. to uh, 
have produced this. Yeah, I just, just found it this morning. I just found it fascinating. Yeah. So things are endlessly, endlessly, uh, there's always more to learn. <laughs> That's, I, I, I made some remarks to Swami Swahananda uh, one time about some things I felt in, in, when I was meditating. And he said, ah, yes, always more to learn. <laughs> so great good night to you all. Until tomorrow night, those of you who join us for the Gita study class tomorrow night, or uh, then the next opportunity would be on Saturday morning. And then on Sunday morning, uh, we're having an open forum on bhakti. And there will be a study guide uh, uh, with some uh, information about bhakti. Um, what the master had to say about it, what Vivekananda had to say about it, and so on. Um, <clears throat> uh, in, 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 that will be a downloadable PDF from this week's newsletter. And you'll also find it after the newsletter comes out. You'll also find it on the website and on the Facebook page. So looking forward to having that discussion with you this Sunday about what is bhakti and how does, how does it... Uh, how, how does it open up our, the possibilities of spiritual practice for us? So, a great good night to you. Night. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. Go in Mother's loving and protective embrace during this dreadful time. I hope our, all of our hearts are with Mother. And loving and protective embrace. Good night. So good, good night. Good Thank night, you. Shankaraji. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye.